Hello, everyone. I'm Jean Vale, and I'm going to read today from James Harriet's favorite dog stories. And you know him as the veterinarian of all things bright and beautiful. And he is also a really gifted writer. I love the way he describes things. So I'm going to begin by reading you the introduction to this book because it gives such lyric description of his native whales. Oops. This was the real Yorkshire with the clean limestone wall riding the hill's edge and the path cutting brilliant green through the crowding heather. And walking face on to the scented breeze, I felt the old tingle of wonder at being alone on the wide moorland where nothing stirred and the spreading miles of purple blossom and green turf reached away until it met the hazy blue of the sky. Evocative stuff? Perhaps, but true. And what is truer still follows next in one of the stories included in this book. But I wasn't really alone. There was Sam, and he made all the difference. Helen, my wife, had brought a lot of things into my life, and Sam was one of the most precious. He was to be my faithful companion. My car... Whoops. Sorry. My car dog, my friend who sat by my side through the lonely hours of driving. He was the first of a series of cherished dogs whose comradeship have warmed and lightened my working life and latterly my retirement. Ever since I was a child, I've always loved dogs. Don, a beautiful, sleek-coated Irish setter, was my first dog. And I learned from an early age the pleasure that one gets from watching a dog, whether scenting after rabbits on the hillside, or indicating quite plainly that it is dinner time, or sleeping in front of the fire, whiffling little noises, perhaps at the rabbits in his dreams. When I decided I wanted to be a vet, I knew that I wanted to be a dog doctor, so I could spend all my time with dogs, but the authorities at the Veterinary College in Glasgow had other ideas at that time, in the mid-30s. Animals were graded according to their importance. Horse, cattle, sheep, pig, and dog. And they decided I shouldn't be, that I should be a horse doctor. In due course, I qualified and was lucky to be offered a job as an assistant vet in North Yorkshire in the town that I call Darrowby in my books. It's what is called a large animal practice, the majority of patients being horses, cattle, sheep, and pigs. What chance was there of my becoming a doc dog doctor as I wanted? However, luck was on my side because Siegfried Farnon, my boss and later to be my partner, loved horses above everything else. He was more than happy to leave the dogs and cats to me while he attended to the Shire horses that were still being used at that time and the hunters and ponies of the more affluent families. As readers who know my books will well remember, I certainly did my fair share of work with the larger animals, but I did love treating the smaller ones. Sometimes it was pure relief to be able to leave behind the cold, wet, and mud of the hillside and tend the ailments of some gentle little animal in a drawing room. And so you won't be surprised that I have included three stories in this book about the Pekingese tricky woo. Oh, that sherry, I can recall the taste of it now. Driving out to the remote farms was a very lonely chore, especially during the winter, but one made a hundred times better when I had a dog or dogs with me in the car. Sam, my beagle, well, Helen's really, is mentioned several times in this book. He was very special, and I can see him now, his big liquid eyes turned to me, suggesting we steal five minutes between appointments to walk on the high moors. 
I could rarely resist his plea. After all, I got so much pleasure, too, from standing for a while looking at the superb landscape spread out in front of me. There was everything here, wilderness and solitude, breathing from the bare fells, yet a hint of softness where the river wound along the valley floor. And in all the green miles around me, there was seldom another human being to be seen. I always had to force myself back into the real world when it was time to go. And when I called to Sam, he would come running up the track toward me, his ears flying in the wind, an almost human smile of contentment on his face. After Sam, I had two dogs together. Hector was a Jack Russell with a typical Chippendale legs and a stumpy tail, which he wagged furiously. In the car, he was never still. He would peer through the windscreen and seem to take in everything that we passed. My other dog, Dan, the black Labrador, had a quite different temperament. He would stretch out on the passenger seat his head on my knee, trusting that I wouldn't miss an opportunity to stop the car somewhere on the moor or in the dale and give them a run. Dan is on the cover of my book, James Harriet's Yorkshire. He was an old dog then. You can just see his graying muzzle against the dark background of the trees and the snowy landscape behind. He is a little dipped in the back, but his eyes are fixed unwavering, not on me, but on the stick in my hand. Throughout his life, he liked to walk with a stick in his mouth, true retriever fashion. As he got older, so the sticks he found to carry became smaller, and I knew that his life was coming to an end the day he returned from his walk without a stick. It is always said that however many wonderful and happy years a dog lives, you know that one day, the day he dies, your dog will break your heart. I have always advised people to get a replacement as soon as possible after their dog has died. A new and endearing pup helps enormously to fill the gaping void one always experiences after a much-loved dog has gone. But when Hector and Dan died within a year of each other, but both having had good long lives, I hesitated. Would I ever be able to find a dog to replace them? I was still able to go on walks with a dog because my daughter Rosie, who lives next door to us, has a beautiful yellow lab, Polly, and was very happy when I wanted to take on dog walking duties. But the car was very empty when I drove out to the farms or visited patients in outlying villages. When I got out to lean over a gate and look down into a valley, there was no one to watch snuffling amongst the heather and the bracken. There was no one to talk to, and the conversation may have been somewhat one-sided, but my dogs never seemed to mind my chatter. So I decided to fulfill a long-time ambition to own a border terrier. I had loved this breed with its whiskery face ever since I had come to work in Yorkshire. But there had never been a litter around when, he was, when we wanted a new dog. This time, however, I was very fortunate to find the last of a litter not far away in Bedale. And so Bodie joined the Harriet household. I don't think any of my other dogs would be too upset if I said that no dog has ever given me as much joy as Bodie, who is lying beside me now as I write. From the moment that I reached down and lifted up the puppy and he curled his little body round, apparently trying to touch his tail with his nose, I was lost to him. He has been a wonderful companion to me, especially since I retired and have had more time to walk. He is getting on now, and his coat is almost more white than brown. This has its advantages because I can see him when he is running through the autumn bracken, when it is on turn. When he was younger, he was almost the same color as the russety red bracken, and sometimes the only means I had to know 
where he had got to was by the high-pitched yelps emanating from the thick undergrowth, which meant that he was after another rabbit, which he very, very rarely caught. I know the chase gave him immense pleasure, however, because he would return to me, his tongue lolling out the side of his mouth, and a look on his face as if to say, well, there's always another day. He is a bit too old now to chase rabbits for real, but he still whiffles in his sleep, so I'm sure he is chasing them in his dreams. And now I've chosen to read you as one of the stories, Jock, the top dog. I had only to sit up in bed to look right across Darrowby to the hills beyond. I got up and walked to the window. It was going to be a fine morning, and the early sun glanced over the weathered reds and grays of the jumbled roofs, some of them sagging under their burden of ancient tiles, and brightened to the tufts of green where trees pushed upward from the gardens among the bristle of chimney pots. And behind everything, the calm bulk of the fells. It was my good fortune that this was the first thing I saw every morning, after Helen, of course, which was better still. Following our honeymoon, we had set up our first home on the top of Skidale House. Siegfried, my boss, up to my wedding and now my partner, had offered us free use of these empty rooms on the third story, and we had gratefully accepted and though it was a makeshift arrangement, there was an airy charm, an exhilaration in our high perch that many would have envied. Helen soon had the kettle boiling, and we drank our first cup of tea by the window looking down on the long garden. From up here, we had an aerial view of the unkept lawns, the fruit trees, the wisteria climbing the weathered brick toward our window, and the high walls with their old stone copings stretching away in the cobbled yard under the elms. Every day I went up and down that path to the garage in the yard, but it looked so different from above. After breakfast, I went downstairs, collected my gear, including suture material for a foal which had cut its leg, went out the side door into the garden. Just about opposite the rookery, I turned and looked up at our window. It was open at the bottom, and an arm emerged holding a dishcloth. I waved, and the dishcloth waved back furiously. It was the start of every day. And driving from the yard, it seemed a good start. In fact, everything was good the raucous cawing of the rooks in the tree above, the clean fragrance of the air which greeted the me every morning, and the challenge and interest of my job. This was the real Yorkshire, with a clean limestone wall, riding the hill's edge and the path-cutting brilliant green through the crowding heather. And walking face on to the scented breeze, I felt the old tingle of wonder at being alone on the wide moorland where nothing stirred and the spreading miles of purple blossom and green turf reached away until it met the hazy blue of the sky. But I wasn't really alone. There was Sam, and he made all the difference. Helen had brought a lot of things into my life, and Sam was one of the most precious. He was a beagle and her own personal pet. He would have been about two years old when I first saw him, and I had no way of knowing that he was to be my faithful companion, my car dog, my friend who sat by my side through the lonely hours of driving until his life ended at the age of 14. He was the first of a series of cherished dogs whose comradeship have warmed and lightened my working life. Sam adopted me on sight. It was as though he had read the Faithful Hound manual, 
because he was always near me, paws on the dashboard, as he gazed eagerly through the windscreen on my rounds, head resting on my foot in our bed sitting room, trotting just beside me whenever I moved. If I had a beer in a pub, he would be under my chair. And even when I was having a haircut, you only had to lift the white sheet to see Sam crouching beneath my legs. The only place I didn't dare take him was to the cinema, and on those occasions, he crawled under the bed and sulked. Most dogs love car riding, but to Sam, it was a passion which never waned. And even in the night hours, he would gladly leave his basket when the world was asleep, stretch a couple of times, and follow me out into the cold. He would be onto the seat before I got the car door fully open. And this action became so much a part of my life that for a long time after his death, I still held the door open unthinkingly, waiting for him. And I still remember the pain I felt when he did not bound inside. And having him with me added so much to the intermissions I granted myself in my daily rounds. Whereas in offices and factories, they had tea breaks. I just stopped the car and stepped out into the splendor which was always at hand and walked for a spell down hidden lanes through woods or, as today, along one of the grassy tracks which ran over the high tops. I like my fellow men, but there are times when it's wonderful to be utterly alone in a wide landscape. Here I can find peace and tranquility. This thing which I had always done had a new meaning now. Anybody who has ever walked a dog knows the abiding satisfaction which comes from giving pleasure to a loved animal. And the sight of the little form trotting ahead of me lent a depth which had been missing before. The dry stone walls climbed up the bare hillsides on the far side of the valley. Those wonderful walls often the only sign of the hand of man, symbolized the very soul of the high Pennines. The endlessly varying pattern of gray against green, carving out ragged squares and oblongs, pushing long antenna to impossible heights until they disappear into the lapping moorland on the summits. Round the curve of the path, I came to where the tide of heather lapped thickly down the hillside on a little slope facing invitingly into the sun. It was a call I could never resist. I looked at my watch. Oh, I had a few minutes to spare before my appointment with Robert Corner. In a moment, I was stretched out on the springy stems, the most wonderful natural mattress in the world. Lying there, eyes half closed against the sun's glare, the heavy heather fragrance around me, I could see the cloud shadows racing across the flanks of the fells, throwing the gullies and crevices into momentary gloom, but trailing a fresh flaring green in their wake. Those were the days when I was most grateful I was in country practice the shirt sleeve days when the bleak menace of the bald heights melted into friendliness, when I felt at one with all the airy life and growth about me and was glad that I had become what I never thought I would be, a doctor to farm animals. A long-eared head blotted out the sunshine as Sam came and sat on my chest. He looked at me questioningly, he didn't hold with this laziness, but I knew if I didn't move after a few minutes, he would curl up philosophically on my ribs and have a sleep until I was ready to go. But this time I answered the unspoken appeal by sitting up and he leaped around me in delight as I rose and began to make my way back to the car. 
The injured foal was at Robert Corner's farm, and I hadn't been there long before I spotted Jock, his sheepdog. And I began to watch the dog, because behind a vet's daily chore at treating his patients, there is always the fascinating kaleidoscope of animal personality. And Jock was an interesting case. A lot of farm dogs are partial to a little light relief from their work. They like to play, and one of their favorite games is chasing cars off the premises. Often I drove off with a hairy form galloping alongside, and the dog would usually give a final defiant bark after a few hundred yards to speed me on my way. But Jock was different. He was really dedicated. Car chasing to him was a deadly serious act which he practiced daily without a trace of levity. Cornette's farm was at the end of a long track, twisting, far, far, twisting for nearly a mile between its stone walls, down through the gently sloping fields to the road below. And Jock didn't consider he had done his job properly until he had escorted his chosen, chosen vehicle right to the very foot. So his hobby was an exacting one. I watched him now as I finished stitching the foal's leg and began to tie on a bandage. He was slinking about the buildings, a skinny little creature who without his mass of black and white hair would have been an almost invisible mite. And he was playing out a transparent charade of pretending he was taking no notice of me wasn't the least bit interested in my presence, in fact. But his furtive glances in the direction of the stable, his repeated crisscrossing of my line of vision, gave him away. He was waiting for his big moment. When I was putting on my shoes and throwing my Wellingtons into the trunk, I saw him again, or rather part of him, just a long nose and one eye protruding from beneath a broken door. It wasn't until I had started the engine and begun to move off that he finally declared himself, stealing out from his hiding place. Body low, tail trailing, eyes fixed intently on the car's front wheels. And as I gathered speed and headed down the track, he broke into an effortless lope. I had been through this before and was always afraid he might run in front of me, so I put my foot down and began to hurtle downhill. This was where Jack came into it, Jock came into his own. I often wondered how he'd fare against a racing greyhound, because by golly, he could run. That sparse frame housed a perfect physical machine and the slender limbs reached and flew again and again, devouring the stony ground beneath, keeping up with the speeding car with joyful ease. There's a sharp bend about halfway down, and here Jock invariably sailed over the wall and streaked across the turf, a little dark blur against the green, and having craftily cut off the corner, he reappeared again like a missile, zooming over the gray stones lower down. This put him into a nice position for the run to the road. And when he finally saw me onto the tarmac, my last view of him was a happy, panting face looking after me. Clearly, he considered it was a job well done, and he would wander contentedly back up to the farm to await the next exciting session perhaps with the postman or the baker's van. And there was another side to Jock. He was an outstanding performer at the sheepdog trials, and Mr. Corner had won many trophies with him. In fact, the farmer could, could have sold the little animal for a lot of money, but couldn't be persuaded to part with him. Instead, he purchased a bitch, a scrawny little female counterpart of Jock, and a trial winner in her own right. With this combination, Mr. Corner thought he could breed some world-beating types for sale. 
On my visits to the farm, the bitch joined in the car chasing, but it seemed as though she was doing it more or less to humor her new mate, and she always gave up at the first bend, leaving Jock in command. You could see her heart wasn't in it. Then the pups arrived, seven fluffy black and white balls, tumbling about the yard and getting under everybody's feet. Jock watched indulgently as they tried to follow him in his pursuit of my vehicle, and you could almost see him laughing as they fell over their feet and were left trailing far behind. It happened that I didn't have to go there for about ten months, but I saw Robert Corner in the market occasionally, and he told me he was training the pups, and they were shaping well. Not that they needed much training. It was in their blood, and he said they had tried to round up the cattle and sheep nearly as soon as they could walk. When I finally saw them, they were like seven jocks, meager, darting little creatures, flitting noiselessly about the buildings, and it didn't take me long to find out that they had learned more than sheep herding from their father. There was something very evocative about the way they began to prowl around in the background as I prepared to get into my car, peeping furtively from behind straw bales, slinking with elaborate nonchalance into favorable positions for a quick getaway. And as I settled in my seat, I could sense that they were all crouched in readiness for the off. I revved my engine, let in the clutch with a bump, and shot across the yard, and in a second the immediate vicinage, vicinity erupted in a mass of hairy forms. I roared onto the track and put my foot down, and on either side of me the little animals pelted along, shoulder to shoulder, their faces all wearing the intent fanatical expression I knew so well. When Jock cleared the walls, the seven pups went with him, and when they reappeared and entered the home straight, I noticed something different. On past occasions, Jock had always had one eye on the car. This was what he considered his opponent. But now, on that last quarter mile, as he hurtled along at the head of a shaggy phalanx, he was glancing at the pups on either side, as though they were the main opposition. And there was no doubt he was in trouble. Superbly fit though he was, these stringy bundles of bone and sinew which he had fathered had all his speed plus the newly minted energy of youth. It was taking every shred of his power to keep up with them. Indeed, there was one terrible moment when he stumbled and was engulfed by the bounding creatures around him. It seemed that all was lost, but there was a core of steel in Jock. Eyes popping, nostrils dilated, he fought his way through the pack until, by the time we reached the road, he was once more in the lead. But it had taken its toll. I slowed down before driving away and looked down at the little animals standing with lolling tongue and heavy fl heaving flanks on the grass verge. It must have been like this with all the other vehicles, and it wasn't a merry game anymore. I suppose it sounds silly to say you could read a dog's thoughts, but everything in his posture betrayed the mounting apprehension that his days of supremacy were numbered. Just round the corner lay the unthinkable ignominy of being left trailing in the rear of that litter of young upstarts. And as I drew away, Jock looked after me, and his expression was eloquent. How long can I keep this up? I felt for the little dog, and on my next visit to the farm about two months later, I wasn't looking forward to witnessing the final degradation when I, which I felt was inevitable. But when I drove into the yard, I found the place strangely unpopulated. Robert Corner was forking hay into the cow's racks in the byre. He turned as I came in. Where are all your dogs, I asked. He put down his fork. 
all gone. By God, there's a market for good work in sheepdogs. I've done right well out of the job. But you'll, you've still got Jock. Oh, I, I couldn't part with that lad. He's over there. And so he was, creeping around as of old, pretending he wasn't watching me. And when the happy time finally arrived and I drove away, it was like it used to be with a lean little animal herring along by the side of the car, but relaxed, enjoying the game, winging effortlessly over the wall and beating the car down to the tarmac with no trouble at all. I think I was as relieved as he that he, he was left alone with his supremacy unchallenged, that he was still top dog. <laughs> this book has, anyone may borrow it from me, but it has the most beautiful illustrations as well as his marvelous writing. Uh, I, how, how about that? Not only was he a, a very good vet, apparently. <laughs> Pardon me? This one is called James Harriet's Favorite Dog Stories. And he's written numerous books, but this is. Have you ever had a dog? Oh, yes. But we didn't have little. I had Rottweilers, big ones. <laughs> wonderful dogs. Much maligned, but wonderful dogs. Yes. Rottweilers are delightful. Yeah, I. Yeah. Yes, it's my book. Would you like to borrow it? I, I, I'd be happy to let you borrow it. Oh, do you have? Yeah. Uh huh. Oh, for heaven's sakes, not too far apart. Uh -huh. Michelle you. left for the day and she was shut in her office. So I, said, I appreciate that. No Thank you. I was afraid it might go off and I didn't know how it was going to go. Thank you so much.